it's a long story. Uh, it will probably take an hour in itself. But um, yeah, so I did um, a very traditional fine art university education, doing three years of painting and sculpture. And just towards the, the end of that, I, was, I became interested in installation art and performance. Uh, and it seemed like a whole new world of possibilities. And I was interested in making things that were quite high off the ground and had some kind of demands on the audience to, to, to appreciate them. And then just as I was getting, becoming aware of this kind of, of work, my course finished and I was left without any kind of resources. So I went away traveling and I went away exploring and looking at myself and came back and saw a friend I hadn't seen for ages. Um, asked her where she'd been and she said, well, I've been in circus school. And I thought, that's it. I'll go to circus school and I'll train as a trapeze artist. So I went and trained as a trapeze artist because it was a way that I would think that I thought I'd be able to learn how to perform physically above the ground and develop more performance skills like that. So I did that and then I mounted um, an aerial, set up an aerial performance company in England and we did various um, durational physical uh, performance pieces suspended from trees, buildings, what have you, with very um, intense sonic backgrounds to them. That work evolved into solo performances using the same thing, which led me into, ex into discovering technology and interactive technologies um, and how I could use my, my body as a physical tool to trigger sound and video in a very physical, performative way. And then that's, that's how I got into technology and that's how I discovered digital technologies and the whole area of interactive art and digital sound, digital video and beginning to really develop more complex electronic interactive sound works. Um, and then so I, I, I considered myself as a sound artist for a long time. Um, and then the real, to, to kind of miss out a big chunk, then the real kind of breakthrough moment really was when I was asked, I was commissioned to make a small new sound installation. Um, and I decided to pursue an idea. I'd, I'd already been working with basic robotics. So I decided to pursue an idea using robots in conjunction with crickets, because crickets were insects that made a lot of sound. And I thought, well, there's my sound element. I can mix the robotics and the crickets. And out of that idea, the installation Small Work for Robots and Insects evolved over two stages in about four years. And then having done that, that then made me realise that there was a lot more work I wanted to do using relationship between technology and living organisms and investigating the information that came out of both systems and how I could build new relationships by manipulating the information that flowed between the two. So that's kind of, that's actually, that's actually the short version of the story. Yeah, also, also you answered the second one, more or less, because I was going to ask you more about the, your music creations. Uh -huh. And the, I, as I read, you, you, you've been doing also DJ and electronic music uh, connected to digital music. Yeah, yeah, I mean that's, that's something I do because I enjoy it and something I kind of see yeah that's more kind of a sideline to what I consider my 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 serious artistic trajectory but I've been yeah I've been involved in other projects collaborations especially where I've worked in a very much more audio-visual sense um, and yeah doing kind of the whole laptop performance thing the laptop musician sitting like that for an hour making things that go uh, I did all, I've done all that a few times. And then generating visuals that go with that using very kind of generative processes for that, which goes along with the whole generative idea and the rest of my work. And I worked on um, a collaborative, a large collaborative piece called 32,000 Points of Light, which was five English artists. Um, we developed a piece for um, a motion simulator, which is, if you go to fairgrounds and trade shows, they have these capsules you go and sit in it. They have the video screen and the surround sound and it simulates the experience of being on a roller coaster or a racing car or a jet fighter play, whatever like that. We created a much more immersive audio-visual installation to put into one of those as a, as a, as a the delivery context. So, so yeah, there's all sorts of work related to my, my main body of work that's dealt with a much more kind of music and sound and and video aspects. You consider it more like uh, your 
enjoy, but I mean like... Uh, yeah, it's, it's all enjoyment. It's all enjoyment, I <laughs> know. Uh, it's not going in a good way. No, I know what you mean, though. I, I know what you mean. It's kind of... Um, no, it's, it's, it's serious work, but whenever I'm generating my own projects, what I consider the Andy Gracie house prods as an artist's work, that kind of work doesn't really fit into that. That's, it's side projects. It's things that happen whenever... Whenever opportunities arise, really, it, it tends to come off. It tends to be much more one-off situations. But, um, it, uh, should we wait? <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, yeah, it varies. It depends on the situation, but it's, it's, it's serious work, but it, it happens as a kind of, um, uh, uh, an, an add-on. To what I consider my my serious work, but obviously, having said that, there's there is a definite connection between the two, and they do feed into each other. Like I'm doing, um, I'm not sure where it is yet, but in the middle of November in Barcelona, I'm doing um, a kind of a live DJ performance using um, my uh, video digital microscope to generate images from soil and water samples, and then do some processing on that with sounds. So. And that's kind of a one-off thing because there's an opportunity to do it. And it's based on my own work, but it's a kind of a more playful expression. I don't know, something like that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and also, um, well, I, t I took it from your work. Like, uh, as, you, as you introduced, the, the title you used for that is yes. You say, who, why, what, why, what, uh, what is, Host yeah. I would like you. I, I read it already, but I would like you to. So, what is host prods? <laughs> well, host prods is. Who, why, and what? Yeah, the who, <laughs> why, I don't know. Uh, who is host prods is me. Um, uh, I, I I used to do all my work under the name Host Productions, uh, which seemed very dull, and then I shortened Host Productions to Host Prods which is a meaningless word, but it sounds a little bit more fun than host productions. And it kind of also means less. So I quite like creating a word as an empty container, then you can put your own meaning into it. And then I kind of, and the reason I, I, I used host prods rather than just using my, my own name was because in the vast majority of my work, it's not just me. It's like I can't do everything as well as I'd want to to make the project to the standard I want to. So I often work with um, an electronics engineer or um, maybe a programmer will help me or someone who knows sound better will help me with things. Or and recently, Brian Lee young Rowe has always had a, 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 some part in the AI programming in works. So there's a whole bunch of people that make the work possible. So I, it feels wrong just to say, Andy Gracie made this. And so host prods, I used host prods to kind of acknowledge the fact that it's not me, it's there's a group of people. But then, but then more recently, I put Andy Gracie host prods because you know, for promotion, basically, just to to make my own name heard a bit more. Because because recently, the, I mean, apart from the the recent collaboration, the Fumix project, the work is much more my own than group efforts. So. So host, host, host Brothers, that's why Host Brothers is called that, what's who Host Brothers is. Um, why? Because, um, well, why is kind of to answer the question, why I'm an artist, and that's an impossible question to answer. You know, why? Be, why? Because, because there's the, the yeah, yeah, yeah there's, I don't know, I, I'd like to meet an artist that can answer that question properly. But why? Because, because I, like all artists, there's a drive to, to, to discover things about the world and to discover things about myself and about ourselves. And um, I think with a necessary kind of childlike wonder about the world and about the information within the world and to, 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 to find a means and a vehicle for expressing that. Um, but then kind of what... I mean, what, what, what my work is all about and why I, why, I, why I practice what I do is because I'm interested in, in, in investigating the, 
the information that's around us, and especially the information that's around us that's generated by, by the natural world and by nature and by organic life, um, and how relationships like symbiosis and parasitism have driven the development of life and the development of information from life. Uh, and how I can also engage in my obsessions with technology and my fetishism for gadgets and devices and robotics by looking at the information within that and then how I can create these symbiotic and parasitic relationships between the synthetic, and the artificial and the natural and the organic and begin to play with these relationships and to begin to discover more about networked ecologies and bio-artificial ecosystems and to, 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 to explore that area. I also have a question about that, like, um, about your investigations on uh, symbiosis and parasitism and connecting mm. intelligence scene. Is there a metaphor under these scientific investigations connected to the human relationship with nature? Um, I don't know whether there's really much of a metaphor in yes. within that. Uh, well, maybe you can do more. And like a metaphor, well, also your investigations are, are directly in relation with that. So yeah. It's not a metaphor, mm. maybe, no? But like, um, is there, like, my question is more like, is there something, something behind that, uh, speaking about the future of the relation to mm. human um, nature? Mm. Um, Where are we going? Yeah, to yeah. Um, I suppose there is. I suppose there is. I suppose that's more of a subtext than what I'm specifically driving at with the work. The um, yeah, my work's much more about um, nature as a whole, which would have to include humans, and how nature as a whole is being redefined via the implications. Um, of technology and the technological applications, natural processes in all in all forms of life, from agriculture to medicine to um, the keeping of pets to, to all our kind of relationships with, with the natural world and how technology is changing that, uh, and how um, and how evolution is an ongoing process, and the humans are part of evolution and now how humans are beginning to alter the whole process of evolution through manipulation of the genetic code of various species and through artificial selection and things like that. So there's, yeah, that kind of relationship between nature, humans and technology is very, very complex. There's no real kind of chain of events or chain of, of connection. Um, and my work, I'm specifically trying to deal with um, um, the relationships of technology and the natural world outside of us. Because, I mean, there's a whole lot of work dealing with the notion of the cyborg and how connecting technology and us as humans and the technology and the body and the, the interpretation of the body and the machinization of the flesh and all these things. Um, I, I don't want to confuse my work with work related with cyborgism, although there's obviously connections and parallels to be made. I think I'm more interested in the, in the human aspect of then how we, by viewing the work I'm making, by me looking at these other relationships, how the, how the human point of view may have to be reinterpreted and how the human position in these relationships between organic life and technology may have to be reappraised and how we can learn about, about where we sight ourselves in this whole complex interrelated web uh, that's the that the work's about. This full uh, well, I tell you what I, what I, as far as I know about it, it's like it's a collective project established by Brian Lee Jango and you in order to explore the living organic environment mm. using artificial intelligence as a tool. So I would like to know when and in which context is Fulmux uh, yeah. uh -huh. Well, Fulmux, Fulmux is now. Myself and Brian have had um, a creative relationship for uh, since about the year 2000, 2001 now. And um, my last three main works have been um, small work for robot and insects, 
fish plant rack and auto inducer have all had input from Brian. Some more work for robot and insects and fish plant rack. Basically, there was an artificial intelligence sized gap, and Brian made an artificial intelligence and put it in, and, and it worked like that, uh, basically speaking. But then the folks project, me and Brian then decided that it would be interesting if we, rather than me being the artist and him being the program and him just making a program for me to use, we decided to try to see what would happen if we did a, a proper collaboration 50 50 and create the whole concept and artwork and realise different projects between us. Uh, so we, we, we basically built the performance project to accommodate that. And also because my work as Andy Gracie, host prods, um, I can see it going off in different directions, still dealing with technology and still dealing with the relations between synthetic and organic and, uh, and our, our relationships with, with that. Um, but I also still want to, to look at very artificial re intelligence related works as well. So it's kind of it's splitting off like that now. Host prods can now go off with all sorts of freedom to explore much more wider areas. And then when I want to work, when me and Brian have a chance to work together and really look at how artificial intelligence can be brought into certain systems like that, then we'll work under the banner of the Pumux project. Um, it's just a way of me keeping keeping tabs on what I'm doing and kind of keeping very defined areas of work. Um, so yes, yeah, so the Thomas project, we made the, the installation auto induce PH1 um, last year and exhibited it this year. Um, that's the, the first Thomas project. project. Uh, it may be the last, it may be the first of many, we, we don't know, we don't know. We, we, haven't, we have no specific plans yet to make a new piece, but the, the options are there. I need to tell me more about uh, this project, the Artemisia PH1. Yeah. I don't know, it's, well, it's, uh, I read it's like, a, it's like the basic relation of rice, like the cultivation technology. Yeah, yeah. It's based on, I mean, there's a, um, like I've mentioned, there's a, one of the threads that, that runs through quite a lot of my work is um, an interest in um, symbiotic and parasitic relationships between species and then how I can begin to create new ones and how I can influence them. And so the FOMOX project will also begin to, to deal with that in the context of artificial intelligence more, more thoroughly. Um, and so the, the, the basic concept we came up with for auto inducer was to, to examine this um, rice growing process from Southeast Asia, where they exploit a naturally occurring symbiosis between um, a, a tiny water plant called Azola uh, and a, a bacteria called Anabena. And the Anabena and the Azola have a symbiotic relationship where the Anabena fixes nitrogen from the air into the plant, um, and then the, the rice farmers use this incredibly nitrogen rich plant as an organic fertilizer for the rice paddies. And it's this incredibly simple, natural, organic, ancient rice growing process and it feeds half the world. Um, and so that was our that was our starting point. It was, it was a, and the auto inducer was devised over quite a long time to to be a, a, a completely mechanized and deliberately over complex way of creating the same system um, and how to, how to kind of manipulate that, 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 that symbiosis, the natural killing symbiosis, and how to create a new symbiosis with the whole technological environment and still enable the system to, to work underneath that, the rice going process. So what we did was we, we, we took the anabena bacteria out of the azole plant and we forced that into a new symbiotic relationship with a new artificial intelligence system that Brian was developing called the Generalized Cellular Signaling uh, System, which basically mimics the way that um, a bacteria colony functions or mimics the way that cell-to-cell -cell communication functions. Um, and the kind of molecules that enable cells and bacteria to communicate and exchange information are called autoinducers, which is where the title comes from. So we 
we kind of cultured the, the organic bacteria in a way that we would be able to extract as much information as possible from its life process and feed that into the, the GCS bacteria, the artificial bacteria, and then to enable, and then to be able to use the, the kind of living code processes from GCS to directly manipulate the life support system culturing behind a bean. So we had this kind of mutual dependency, this kind of symbiosis, and this thing that would kind of oscillate between symbiosis and parasitism between the two, between the organic and the, and the synthetic there. And then the huge amounts of information that that, that interchange generated would then control the behaviours of this kind of robotic rice farming system with the robotic arms that were farming their soil and delivering it to the rice valley that kind of encircled the whole piece. I have, I have a very changing relationship with fish plant rack. It seems to be a very popular piece. Mine. It seems to, people really seem to respond well to it, um, which is good. It's, um, it's, it's also a frustrating piece because it's still kind of incomplete. As, um, the, I've, I've shown the piece twice. I've shown it in Madrid and I've shown it here in Barcelona. And both times I've shown it, I haven't been able to use the live fish that it's designed with. It was built in my studio using the live fish and, and it works properly like that. But both times I've been able to use it, the gallery, uh, La Casa Entendida in Madrid and the Spy Cultural de Caca Madrid here in Barcelona, neither of them would allow me to use the live fish. Uh, and if I had put in the live fish, there was no way they could guarantee the, the, the well-being and the necessary maintenance of the fish. And so, I mean, this, which is a, a whole other conversation about the issues of showing bio art or art using living systems in, in gallery spaces in terms of the time scale of the works and the complexity of maintaining the works it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a very difficult subject a difficult issue that um, most most exhibitions although not all have been there's been several most exhibitions showing live works but most exhibitions dealing with artists dealing with life sciences end up being documentation for the most part <coughs> but um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm still waiting to show the piece with the live fish the way it's intended, which is the only way that the information really properly cycles around the piece. So this whole idea of information exchange as well, where the information starts from the fish, the information is passed to the robot, the robot passes it to plants, the plants pass it to, uh, back to the robot, and the robot passes it to a video screen and then back to the fish. And then, so the information keeps going round and round and it gets, it's like the game Chinese Whispers. Where I don't know if you know this game Chinese Whispers, is you play it at parties and someone comes up with a sentence and you kind of whisper it to the person next to you and they whisper to the person next to you what they think they've heard and then at the end it's all hilarious because something completely different has come out. So it's kind of like that, this process where the information gets passed on and modified and passed on and modified and passed on and, and then it comes back to its source and it goes around again. So fish plant rack is designed to work in that way and that kind of const constantly modified information is what makes the piece function is what makes the, the, the whole ecological system continue to evolve and, and generate new modes of behaviour. And, um, and yeah, and you know, kind of the more I think about the piece, the more I kind of analyse it, and the more I discuss with the people, the more I realise that it's a particularly interesting piece and a very notable piece in, in my development as well. Uh, and how much I'm dying to show it with the fish. I was supposed to be showing it next month in Slovenia with the live fish, but it all fell through the last minute. Right. Various reasons. Okay. <laughs> okay. So maybe now, maybe now is a good question to ask you. Uh, do you think, do you think your, your work is aimed to the artistic community, the scientific one? <laughs> or to the general edition, to uh, many kind of people? Um, who is it aimed at? I'd like to say that it's aimed at everybody. I'd like to say that it's, it's aimed at whoever approaches the work. And uh, I think it's really important that... I think it's really important that there is something in the work that anyone can approach it and get something out of it. Um, not to kind of make it lowest common denominator kind of work where it's available to everyone, the whole thing is completely open 
and completely transparent and delivers a message trailer like a museum exhibit. It's not like that, but there has to be some level that anyone can, can appreciate at home. So that level it's aimed at everybody, but I suppose if we're talking about people of a more artistic persuasion, people of more scientific persuasion, it's I suppose it's aimed at them both but in different ways. It's aimed at them both in different ways. The work, I mean, there's, there's a very strong foundation of science in the work, and it's, it, the work depends on science to exist. Um, it uses, it uses, um, uses real scientific processes to make it work. That auto induced would be impossible to produce without employing very strict scientific processes and principles. Um, and the early pieces as well, you know, the, the science, scientific foundation makes them strong. But then, Science is interesting up to a point. Science, is, science becomes restrictive after a point. Um, science, science, runs, science is run by much stricter rules than art. Uh, and science, to put it very simply, science is a lot more about answers and results and productivity, where I think art has to be much more about questions uh, and ambiguity um, and mischievous, uh, mischievousness and playfulness and all those kind of ways are very important to art. So I kind of... I like to use the science to kind of come back on itself and begin to ask questions about science and begin to challenge science or begin to play the idea, play with the ideas of real science and fake science or how you begin to be a little bit more devious with what science is really about and also to, to kind of start to strip away some of the layers that hide science from the people as well or kind of makes, make science appear inaccessible because it's not. Science isn't inaccessible, science is very accessible. So, I suppose the bit that's saying that scientists is kind of a little bit having a, having a poke at them, having a bit of a kind of trying to challenge the scientists a little bit. Uh, but they, yeah, I don't tend to get very good reactions from scientists about the work. No. There was, um, I didn't meet him unfortunately, but there was a, a what was he? Um, a, a biologist of some description that came to see auto inducer when it was on show in England. Um, he was very, very upset because he wasn't seeing the things that he wanted to see. <coughs> um, he wanted to see certain kinds of data about the processes that were happening. He wanted to see daily readouts of pH levels and temperatures and productivity and he wanted logs of everything to see that log so he could, so he could, so he could make some kind of quantitative analysis of the piece. Um, and that's what he wanted to see, and he was very upset that wasn't there. And you know, his argument was that the piece failed artistically and scientifically because the information that he wanted wasn't there. Um, and I think that was really missing the point of the piece because it's not about, yes, yeah, about the information it produces, but the information it produces is what makes the processes happen. It's much more about the processes that are happening and how we can observe the evolution of those processes rather than the specific information. All the information is in there, but we don't need to see it. It's much more a case of it's more important for me to experience that work and the scientific elements in the work on a much more pragmatic level, on a much more, on more like a gut instinct than a, a, a cerebral quantitative approach to what's going on. So in that way, it doesn't really appeal to scientists, apart from the most open-minded ones. Uh, and they are, I know, they're, they're out there. Um, so yeah, maybe it's more aimed at artists, but that kind of sounds a little bit... Um, what's the word? Yeah, a little bit too self-referential, well, yeah. incestuous. Well, maybe that's what happened, you know, now, like, yeah. the connection between different fields and making something that is not so easy to qualify, not to, yeah. Yeah. to put in a box. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm, all, I'm, um, I'm a big fan of grey areas. And the whole kind of black and white thing that this is for that, this says that, this is aimed at that, and likewise this is not that, this is not said that, this is not aimed at that. That doesn't interest me at all. Uh, I don't know whether that's because it's a cop out or whether because it just seems to me much more honest to, to aim at those great areas and to look at the areas where there's discussion. I don't see the point of making work that says this is that, this is that, and this is that, and this is how it is. I don't see the point of that. I think it's, it's, it's much more vital to begin to look at the areas where there is no clear answer 
where there's discussions to be had and where there's uncertainty and where there's ambiguity because that's, that's, that's dynamic, that's where change can happen. That's where, that's where the brain has to kick into gear and begin to explore things, investigate things. So, so yeah, so all those kind of categories between art and science and technology and relationships like this is sci art, this is bio art, this is techno art, I swear. I, I don't know, I just I, I see myself as just making art one of any of those things. It's because that's the easiest definition to give it as well, you know, they're kind of I like the I like the um, the definition that um, Oren Katz from Symbiotica gives to his work. He calls them objects for cultural discussion. And I think that's a really good thing. Objects for cultural discussion. Kind of pretty much hits the nail on the head. I read somewhere, probably in this uh, interview it's on the uh, say like um, about your work, they were saying it's also poetical and humorous. Yeah. You know? um, I don't know, I would like to ask your own opinion about it. Do you think it's also poetical and humorous? I, I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. I, um, yeah, it was funny. Um, a couple of years ago, or a year or two ago, I did um, a presentation of my work in uh, Open Friday, you know, the, down in the Raval, this group Open Friday group, they have, um, everyone knows Open Friday, they're great people. Uh, I did a presentation there about my work, and I showed um, the video of a small work for robot and insects, uh, and for the first time, I've shown that video hundreds of times to various groups of people of various ages, but for the first time, you're there, and everyone started laughing. Spontaneously, everyone started laughing, and I was like, that's really weird. So I, I, I'd never seen it as being particularly not funny. There's, there has, there's a kind of a playfulness and a humour in there, but I'd never seen it as being funny. But um, suddenly people were finding it very, very funny. And I thought, like, that's great. You know, certain things were happening in the video, and people were really properly laughing and amused. So, so yeah, the, I mean, obviously humour is coming out in some way, and it's. I think the, it's more um, I'm concerned with uh, a playfulness. Uh, partly because I find it really hard to be properly serious anyway, and partly because I think, I mean, the whole, the whole notion of play is, is incredibly important, I think. And I think it's really, I think it's a real shame that um, the kind of modern um, image of adulthood is image of a, a species that doesn't play anymore or isn't allowed to play or feels uncomfortable with play. Uh, and um, in, in some of the in, the, in the research group I'm involved with in England, there's one of the guys that's really serious investigating play, he had a Nesta Fellowship Award to investigate play and, and magic and things like that. Because, because it's a way of getting into people really quickly and people kind of disarm themselves when they're playing or when they're confronted with humour. Um, when people stop taking things so seriously, there, paradoxically, there seems a way to deliver a more serious message. It's almost like a Trojan horse. You can kind of get information in there in a way. So, and also because I, don't know, I think if everything's taken too seriously, it's it's, it's kind of tragic, <laughs> really. <laughs> um, so yeah, so humor is very important. Uh, and the, the the poetry, the poetry as well, because. I don't know, I think a lot of this, without kind of really wanting to talk about things being too childlike in terms of play and, and wonder, I think that kind of child, childish, the, the, the childlike as opposed to the childish way of approaching things is, is, a, is, is a wonderful way to approach the world, especially the world of science, the world of nature, the world of information, because it's a very, very open way of approaching things. And, the, the, the childlike way of approaching things is a way of really sucking in an experience and really approach, really seeing the wonder in things rather than just kind of say in the adult style way to make sense of it. I think, I think we, we, we can tend to make sense of something too soon and we don't give ourselves the chance to wonder at something and to see the poetry and to see the beauty and to see the playfulness and I think these are all very, very, very important human emotions that um, as well as having their all very, you know, light side, there's a very, very fundamentally important part of the human soul and the human spirit 
and the human way of learning and evolving. So I think they're very, very important things to have in my work. Um, and especially when I'm dealing with sometimes quite important issues about evolution and life and where we're going with that and where we're going in our technologized relationships with life, um, with, with nature, then it can become a very, very heavy, dry subject. And I think to put some humor in there as this Trojan horse to try and get it across somewhere. Um, but not comedic humor. There's almost some kind of accidental sense of the ridiculousness. Accidental sense of, of the ridiculous in the work that hopefully conveys that playful, poetic message in that. Um, I wonder, there's, um, I mean, on my website there's the quote about um, kind of approaching things with, in a sense of wonder and awe and being a much more kind of pragmatic way of understanding the universe and that wonder is a different kind of understanding than um, kind of intellectually processing something. Um, and I'm, I'm having an interesting conversation with a guy called Mitchell Whitelaw. Uh, at the University of Canberra at the moment, and we were discussing wonder recently, and he, he, was, he was telling me that he saw wonder as almost being a way to deal with over complexity, that if, we, if we're confronted by a complex system, that we, will, that we realize that we will never understand how this thing works, then we can fall back on wonder, because the thing is, we don't understand it. It's fascinating, but we don't understand it. So we so will then use wonder to to deal with it almost. But I I like to see wonder as a much more proactive kind of emotion that we can choose to respond with wonder. Maybe we can kind of um, understand the complexity of the system. We can understand the whole process within a system. But we can choose to use wonder as one of our tools for making sense of it. Uh, and I prefer to look at it as a much more proactive thing. It's something we have within us. We don't have to fall back on it. We can use it as a very powerful tool for understanding and knowing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's artists like, I mean, it's, I think some of the most powerful, more activist type work, with like, you know, the thing with the process of the Yes Men? The Yes Men, are, they're a pair of uh, American artists, very activist artists, activist artists, that um, they make incredibly powerful, subversive work. Um, it's also hilarious, you know, I think, and some of the humour comes from the, the sheer audacity of what they're doing, and partly just through their approach of how they actually do it. And also, people like the Critical Art Ensemble, there's, they play with humour as well, and their work is very powerful and very activist, and obviously now in the wake of events considered very, very dangerous, but they, they still come back and they use humour, or they, they, they ridicule, and they, they use a sense of the ridiculous to, to, to use that as well. And so it can be a very, very powerful tool. But that, I mean, that's not to say that there's also a lot of very important work dealing with very serious global situations that is not humorous at all, that is also incredibly powerful and useful work. And it doesn't have to be humorous, but I think it's, it's a powerful tool for those that, that want to use it. Yeah. OK, so now like going to the next chapter, like, mm. I would like to ask you more, like, in general, like, uh, from the moment you came to Barcelona, mm. like, two years ago, um, you started your laboratory, you know, so if I can see, say, uh, your laboratory here, you start yeah. your work here, and um, you feel like a, like a big change from the moment you came to Barcelona at the very beginning, until now, we change in relation to the, 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 the art, the technology, and the science field. Something growing up. Well, something yeah. Yeah, I mean, there has been definitely. I've been, I've been coming to Barcelona for three and a half years now. I mean, I'm still. I still spend a lot of my time in England and working with lots of projects in England as well. So there's still the kind of the two influences, kind of Barcelona influences, influences being getting much stronger. But um, I don't know. I mean, I think in, in terms of the, the way I use science in the work, I think that's just been a natural progression that was happening anyway. Uh, and my kind of laboratory skills 
came about from something I did in England. I, 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 I did um, a, a week-long symbiotica workshop, a kind of biotech, bioengineering workshop in London uh, a year and a half ago, something like that. And that's where I kind of really suddenly made some sort of laboratory process and had the confidence to use laboratory techniques myself in my own studio. So, yeah, I don't think it's really the, 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 the Barcelona influence creatively, but I think coming and spending a lot of time here and dealing with all the challenges of new countries and new cultures and new languages and new menus and <laughs> all these kind of things sets your mind working in different processes. I think it's like, I think I, I have this theory that it's, it's, it's very beneficial to regularly pull the rug from under your own feet. And if you're familiar with this, this, this saying, kind of pull the rug from under someone's feet as you just completely unsettle them. You know, you have a very solid foundation, then you go, take that away. And suddenly you, you, you have to start thinking on your feet again. You have to start really using your brain and looking at it's just solutions for everyday problems and solutions, yeah, solutions of how to begin to, to make artistic connections and how to talk with other artists, not just about the work they're doing, but actually to physically have the words in the language to be able to, to talk with it and to, to, to relate to my work in another language and from another um, creative culture's point of view. So I think it's much more of that kind of circumstantial effect, which has been very, very important about spending time in Barcelona more than the, the direct scientific or, or artistic influence. To be honest, I haven't really, um, I haven't really had much of a sense of that. Uh, I mean, I'm aware of all the support institutions like Hangar, CCCB, metronome, all these places, um, I haven't really had a lot of contact with them, really. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've had, I mean, my, yeah, I, I've had some good experiences here. I mean, I've, 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 I've been really lucky to have some exhibitions here. I was invited to show Ob Observatory in 2003, which was fantastic, and I've, I was able to show Fish Plant Rack here twice. That was commissioned by a, a, a boss in a curator Monica Veggio. Uh, so there's that, there's um, people like Art Knows, which are interviewing me, which is great. And, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the, the new things that are happening at Hangar with the new director and with people like Alex Basada that are creating these um, fantastic kind of technology and consultancy workshops there, which I think is a, is a fantastic project. So there's also things, all sorts of things happen on the Open Friday, people, all these people I've had contact with, but I haven't really had much of a working relationship with them. Um, but I, I think actually, then I think kind of coming from England, being an English artist, we're, English artists are, uh, are really, really, really lucky. Um, compared to what I know from here and what I know from spending time in America, and I was recently in Japan doing a big research trip in Japan as well, and in all these countries, but there's loads of interesting stuff going on. There's very, very, very little support for artists, um, apart from institutions like the ones we mentioned. In, whereas in England we have the Arts Council, and you know, in, it's only since coming and spending more time over here and finding about the artist support networks here that I realise just how lucky artists are in England. Uh, and people have people people talk too harsh about the Arts Council, but the fact that kind of an individual artist at any stage in their career can apply for funding to do research or to do a project to build a piece of work. Um, it's absolutely fantastic. You know, it's like, it, I mean, there's, there's a course like in, in Japan, you can only get su support for a project once you have become established. So the whole process of becoming established is incredibly difficult. People have you know, made massive sacrifices. So, so yeah, so I mean, for me, I still consider myself very really lucky to be an English artist and have that kind of support from there. Although I actually find, so in terms of just being a solo, an individual artist, being English is fantastic and being based in England is fantastic with support from the Arts Council. But then spending time in Barcelona and working on projects in Barcelona, the actual creative climate and the, the sheer amount of interesting things that are happening, being done by Hangar, the CCCB, etc., 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 actually make it a really, really stimulating place to work. 
Uh, and for me, I mean, I'm, I'm lucky having the best of both worlds. I have all my English support networks and I have the stimulation of the things going on here. So, yeah, that's, yeah, I, don't know, I, yeah, I don't know how else to answer that really, but, yeah. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's been perfect. Um, okay, so you, you, you answered the second one, both together, because I wanted you to, to, to oh, professional in terms of I think I think artists have to be professional in terms of how you consider yourselves how you consider yourself to be an artist say I am an artist uh, I will have no shame about being an artist and I will hold my head up high being an artist and I will work as hard as I can all the time and commit myself to my work and I know that and I think also in the current climate an artist has to conduct themselves like a business the, I mean, two of the most important things in, in business are marketing and networking, and for an artist it's exactly the same. Without marketing yourself and networking, you find it very, very hard to get opportunities and to make interesting work and, and have the adventures that make being an artist so interesting. Um, I, think, I think the kind of the autodidact part is, is a separate issue. I think. I think, I think a lot of artists will generally tend towards that kind of way of learning anyway. Um, because, I mean, for me, I'm now using a lot of biological processes in my work. I don't need to go away and study biology for three years. I mean, it'd be fantastic if I did, but I don't need to. The projects that I do, there's certain things that I need to know how to do uh, and to develop an understanding of. So the best way to do that is to teach myself. And obviously I, you know, like I consult with scientists and I try and talk to as many as possible and I have as much guided practical experience as possible. But it's kind of best to teach myself the bits, to find the bits I need and to teach them myself somehow. Um, yeah, but the artist as a professional, I think, I mean, look at kind of people like Jeff Koons, you know, he's like the, the prime example of an artist that set himself up as a, a professional businessman, you know? The whole kind of Koons enterprise is... I kind of, many people think it's... Many people really look down on him, but I think he's brilliant. I think what he's doing is brilliant. I think it's fascinating. I think it's hilarious. Um, I think it's a very interesting model about the comment on the kind of the current artistic role. I think you see many, many artists now are kind of are actually more inspired by Jeff Koons than they'd like to than they'd like to let on. Yeah, because also it's like kind of uh, well, uh, we're, we're about like if you're an artist, we're about uh, your national insurance, your uh, all yeah, this yeah. kind of you know. You have to do it the same. You, you, I mean, you have to take care of your own pension, and your own national insurance. You have to do your own accounts. You, you know. I mean, I like another great thing in England is we have this very fine social security network, which allows you to claim 100. And, I don't know how much it is now, 150 pounds every two weeks, and you can live on. So you know, lots of artists will make do with that, and they'll go around making their work, and you know, they're supported by the government making work. You know. It's getting harder and harder and harder to do it. But I, you know, I, I, I had to do that for years. After leaving my degree, I had to do that for years and years. And, and then suddenly, you, the, you have to t make the decision to, to take yourself more seriously and go, actually, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it. Uh, and I will, I'll get it. I will now decide that I am an artist, and that's what I'll do, and I'll make my living off that. And you have to put yourself in that whole different mentality. And then, yeah, suddenly there's all that stuff, national insurance, 
pensions, God knows what else, bank accounts, accounts, all this stuff that becomes part of the job of being an artist. And nowadays it's very job-like. All this whole kind of romantic notion of the artist living in his little studio and you know, eating beans out of a tin is it's rubbish, you know? There's people doing it, but you can't... I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm obviously I'm talking about the kind of work that I'm involved in, making work using technology, making work using science, making larger work. You, you can't do it without a certain level of resources, and you can't acquire those resources without a certain amount of commitment to your career as an artist, I think. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm sure there's many people that would disagree with me, but that's my experience, which is all I can really talk about. So, yeah, basically, you, you have to be professional in attitude, if not in definition. <laughs>